this is such an honor to have this conversation with you. Um, I've been a fan for, for a long time, so I have many, many questions. So we will see how many I will be able to squeeze in this evening. Um, but I want to start off by introducing you some mm -hmm. uh, and also reading the motivation from the jury. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Laurie, um, you wrote a couple of books, but the one that you were really, your breakthrough novel mm. was Speak which was released in 1999. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, there has been quite a lot of, uh, of novels, oh. both for, for the younger um, readers and teens. Yeah. Um, and then you came out in 2018, was it? With Xiao. Yeah. 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 Uh, which is your memoir. Yeah. Uh, and we will talk about your work and what, your work has meant both to you, but also what it has meant for, for readers mm. and in the political climate that mm. is today in the US. Um, but I will then read the motivation from the jury. In her tightly written novels for young adults, Lori Halls Anderson gives voice to the search for meaning, identity and truth, both in the present and the past. Her darkly radiant realism reveals the vital role of time and memory in young people's life. Pain and anxiety, yearning and love, class and sex are investigated with stylistic precision and dispo <laughs> disposate wit. With tender intensity, Laurie Halls Anderson evokes moods and emotion and never shies from, from even the hardest things. Yeah, it's a, it's a really nice motivation. <laughs> yeah. So congratulations on being an Astrid Lindgren <laughs> Memorial Award laureate. Tack så mycket. Uh, when I saw the, uh, the announcement, uh, I was seeing it from, uh, from home, mm -hmm. online. So I rushed to my, my, um, my bookcase and I pulled out um, what is this? Självra um, minne, which is uh, The Impossible Knife of Memory, which was uh, the first novel that I read by you. Huh? And I sort of hugged it, and I was so happy. Um, both because your, your novel and what you're writing about has really touched me, mm -hmm. but also um, highlighting the subject matters that you do write about. Um, and I know what the, the award means to to those kind of novels. Yeah. So I was like, yay, now even more people will, wow. will find this authorship. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I have a couple of quotes that I want to, um, to read to in start this uh, okay. conversation. Uh, and the first one is from Speak. Um, and it's about finding, um, finding your voice. It's in the dedication, which is oh. something so this is um, a graphic novel uh, of Speak. Mm -hmm. um, and the dedication reads, to everyone seeking their voice and reaching for the power. And when I read that, that sort of summarized your entire, oh. um, what, what I find that you, you do, that no matter what the time is, yeah. current or past, no matter what kind of characters, mm. you're writing about finding yourself, your voice, and the power that you have within. Um, and also feeling like you've lost control. Mm -hmm. So I'm really curious to how you came to write, speak, mm. and, and we will take it from there. Okay. I have to say, first of all, thank you all for coming. And I'm so happy that I met Johanna on this trip because I feel like, like, like we're sisters. <laughs> and she just, your, your approach to how intensely deep you go into books and share them with people, but doing a little bit of, you know, doing the, the, the investigation. And it's just, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. So, okay. 
So Speak was not a book I was going to write. At that point in my life, um, uh, my oldest daughter was just about 12. Um, we had moved a couple times. I was working as a freelance journalist. I was thinking very seriously of going to nursing school because my mother always wanted me to go to nursing school. She never trusted being a writer. And I had, I had published a few pic picture books for younger children um, that went out of print instantly <laughs> as soon as they were published, but it was my beginning. And I actually had been working on... Uh, this novel, Fever 1793, yep. a historical novel. I've been working on that for several years and it was still terrible. But that was getting me in the, that was teaching me how to craft a longer piece mm -hmm. for an older reader. And I was learning a lot about the structure and uh, of writing and things like that. And then I had a terrible nightmare one night. And in this nightmare, I knew, a young girl, a young teen girl was sobbing, just, you know, when you hear somebody crying like that, especially a child, you drop what you have and you run because something terrible has happened. And it was so startling. It woke me up. And um, when I have bad dreams, I often, if I try to go back to sleep, they show up again. Mm -hmm. It's so annoying. So I was, ah. Um, so I wound up journaling because I found that if I have uh, bad dreams or good dreams, I like to put them in my journal and they, then they'll let me go to sleep. And I, I kept on thinking about this teenage, this, I, I never thought of writing a book for teens until this happened, mm -hmm. never. Um, and I, you know, I was like, oh, what is this, this is bizarre. And so I continued to journal for a few weeks about who is this kid and what's going on here. And finally I went, oh, oh, now I get it because my daughter was turning 12 um, and she was bringing me back. I think we, many of us, well, many people who raise children, sometimes you can see a child go through an age or somebody, a kid you know, and it brings back your age, you at that mm -hmm. age. And I was raped when I was 13 years old. I didn't tell anybody. I still, at that point when I was having that bad dream, hadn't told anybody. And as a result of that attack, um, I became very depressed and did a lot of drugs and wasted several years of high school and was, was a mess, was a mess. And I think what happened that night is that my subconscious whispered, you have to deal with this now because you can't be a good mother to Stephanie and Meredith unless you take care of your own business. So... Um, I just really wrote the book for me because I knew, and speak is not what happened to me when I was attacked. There was, the situation of the main character is a different, a little bit different than mine, but the emotional journey of the character, which is what I was really working on, of having a bad thing happen and then not knowing how to speak up about it or who to turn to, I think that happens sadly with so many of us and, and our kids and teens. Um, so that's, that was sort of my, the, the big thought as I was trying to write this silly book. And after a year I had a book and I sent it out and it got rejected and it came back and I was like, oh, okay, it's never good, you know, but I, you know, if you're, if you're egotistical enough to write a book, you're usually arrogant enough to, oh, <laughs> someone's going to publish it, right? So out the door it went, the second publisher liked it, still had some revision to do. But when they, when the book was published, my editor did not want me to get my hopes up. So she, she was very kind of cold in a very practical way. She said, mm, nobody write, teenagers don't read books. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Don't, yeah. I've heard that in Sweden a little bit. Mm, you are so wrong. She said, but librarians and teachers will read anything. <laughs> <laughs> Also true. Um, and so they were going to sell, you know, a couple thousand copies and then everything changed. Yeah. Um, and Shout is your memoir. Mm. And I put a sticker saying, Conspiracy is the, the, the title of the chapter. They said if Speak sold a couple of thousand copies, we'd be lucky because teenager didn't like to read. I had no experience or hope. I never thought it would be published at all. And to now know that what Speak has come to do for, yeah. for your authorship yeah. and also that thinking no one would 
would read it now receiving a Sri Lingra Memorial Award because you then continue. One day a man called to tell me I was a finalist for the National Book Award, which is a really big American uh, literary prize. Confused, I called my editor who explained I needed to buy a dress, a fancy <laughs> one, because this was a seriously big deal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and anyone who saw the ceremony for a Sri Lingra Memorial Award will know that you know, it's a big thing, and your dress was spectacular. <laughs> so. It's a different dress. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, I, so I've bought, I've, pur I've purchased two dresses in the past uh, 25 years. Yeah. Which um, is when you receive a big giant award. award. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have to buy dresses anymore because I got the big one and I'm good. Yeah. Uh, no, but it was really fascinating to read yeah. that, how that was how it started out for yeah. you. Um, and then, everything sort of took off and mm. Speak has now been been around for, for a long time and is still really mm -hmm. um, in the debate and mm -hmm. um, vital. Um, and I was thinking about the subject matter as mm. well. So Speak is about Melinda who is raped and who turns to silence. Yeah. Um, she calls the police but she's unable to tell them what happened. Right. There was, and all this happened at, at one of those drinking parties you never want to admit that you went to as a teenager mm -hmm. and you don't want your kids to go to. Yeah. Um, and when I read the novel uh, the first time, come to mind does Dr. Maya Angelou, mm -hmm. uh, who is an American author, who wrote, I Know Why the Cage Birds Sing, um, which is about her experience being raped um, at a young age and finding that by telling someone something bad happens mm -hmm. um, and she then becomes mute, yeah. afraid of her own voice. Yeah. And then, you know, when reading this novel as well as the adaption then mm -hmm. into um, a graphic novel, yeah. Melinda is actually reading that same book. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, she's lying in bed um, here. So how has the journey been then from 99 releasing yes, Speak yeah, yeah. and then it's turned into a graphic a novel? Graphic, yeah, um, it's been a, a remarkable journey. And it's interesting, I'm still learning about all of this. You just said something that made me, that made me think something I've never thought in relation to my work before. Because you made the, you drew the parallel between Dr. Maya Angelou's uh, attack and, and her work and how, um, and I actually put Maya Angelou in Speak originally because Speak was written in the late 1990s. We were having a little bit of censorship there. Yeah. And she was then a frequently censored author. Yep. And there were lots of debates about should a, her book, I Know Why a Cage Bird Sings, be taught to kids. Um, and I just realized that, that the choice that some people make, that I made and she made, to not speak, I wonder if it's, if it's that not, we, we, we can't trust ourselves, we can't trust our voices because we don't dare, but it's probably also tied to, we, we can't trust our bodies either because mm -hmm. they've been violated, they've been, something's happened. And um, so that's just, you know, you still grow and learn. Um, the graphic novel was a fascinating thing because it came about 20 years or so after Speak was published. Graphic novels are huge in the United States and I, I'm such a, an advocate for them. But to revisit the story, because when I wrote this story I had young children who are now totally grown, also had great dresses uh, the other night, um, but, and now I'm a grandmother. And so and as a woman who had found my voice and had been blessed with so many opportunities to speak about these things in, in the years in the middle. I was a different person and a different writer. So I had to reread the book, the whole thing, which I hadn't done for a long time. And I found a scene that was really a bad, shouldn't, should, I, that sh I should have taken that one out. So that's not in the graphic novel. <laughs> it's not a bad scene, but it was a, a repetition. And, and in terms of the craft involved, um, I wrote what we call in US the script for the graphic novel. So I wrote 
every, I would, I would say, every panel in the book, I would tell the artist, Emily Carroll, a wonderful Canadian author, uh, art, artist, what I wanted the background setting to be, what's the action, who's talking, and then I would have to throw out all of my wonderful words because there was that much space on the page for, for dialogue and things. And it was really a wonderful um, exercise, a writing exercise that boiled the story down to the, the core of it, to the, to the, abs to the bones of the story. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it's, a, it's a slightly different experience to see the book than it is to imagine it in your head. Um, and so I, I learned so much. And also, I think, too, in the graphic novel, having lived 20 years longer and having spoken to tens of thousands of survivors of sexual violence, most of them pretty young, some of them older than me, um, so I, I, there's a different kind of weight guided me through this book. Uh, I know so well now that when we see adults who are having a hard time. We all know adults who, who struggle, especially adults who are choosing behaviors that aren't really healthy. And these behaviors are often their way of coping with that internal pain. And at least in my experience in the US, so many people are, have some kind of trauma or pain in their childhood or in their teenage years. And it doesn't get addressed because we, at least in the U.S., we struggle to talk to people about these things. But when we, I know that when that pain doesn't get addressed, do you know the word festers? It becomes infected. Not your body, but it infects your soul. And, and so there's so many adults um, in my world in the U.S. that are walking around um, crippled, if I may, by their pain, and imagine if we could, as a world, create a body of literature that would allow every person who's been harmed to find their voice, mm. to find the person that is trustworthy and loving that they can turn to and take care of it then. Um, those were the kinds of things I was thinking about as I made the transition from the novel to the graphic novel. Um, and it's... None of this was supposed to happen. I think that's the most remarkable thing, especially for anybody in the audience. I don't know about you, but I have my fingers crossed. <laughs> anybody who has that book you're working on, right? And you're like, oh, no one's going to pay. You know, I think, I, I believe in a loving God. And I believe that if you have the desire to create something artistic, you absolutely have the talent. You 100, that your voice needs to be expressed in the way that you want to express it. The world is hungry for it. Um, you might get rejected. But the most important part is the creation and, and that sharing of your vision and your voice. I'm mm. sorry, I'm going off on a tangent <laughs> no, no. here. She's got so many questions. <laughs> right. uh, no, but what I find interesting is that this is your breakthrough novel that still lives on mm -hmm. and now, um, as we said, been turning to a graphic novel. And you write in your memoir, um, this is the story of a girl who lost her voice and wrote herself a new one. Yeah. And I find that you do that time and time again, not you per se, mm -hmm. but we find these characters sort of feeling lost and that could be not knowing where they're going to go to college mm -hmm. or how to deal with their father's PTSD um, and feeling or you being a slave and think that you're being, you know, given mm -hmm. freedom. Mm. Um, and all these characters that you then write their voice yeah. and by doing so, showing the reader how to find their voice. Mm and then become sort of a new, because then you know when you have your voice, you have the power. Sort yes, of. exactly. Yeah. The voice is the power. And, and, and with that voice, not only do you have the power to express yourself and you know, to take up the space you deserve to take up in the world, um, but now you have the ability to connect with other people and people have the ability to connect with you. And that's 
that's our role, I believe, as humans. Is is and and it's, oh gosh, it's so heartbreaking when kids and teenagers feel unseen, mm-hmm. feel like they don't have any power, feel like they're no one, no one, they can't speak up. They don't know how to speak up. Uh, and so, and believe me, I'm not the only writer who writes about this. There are plenty of great authors here and around the world. And Speak came of age in the U.S. It was published in this kind of first wave of YA literature. Mm-hmm. Um, Walter Dean Myers was one of the people writing there uh, as well, and a bunch of other great, great, talented people. And 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 we saw the response to these books from teens. It wasn't my editor was a little wrong. It wasn't that teens wouldn't read. It was that teens wouldn't read boring books. <laughs> Nor should they. <laughs> uh, but if I, we've, I've seen in my career, if, if they're not for everybody, but if, if a kid connects with a book, if you hand them something that, that makes them see, feel seen, I'm going to quote Dr. Rudine Sims mm-hmm. Bishop again, the great American scholar who talks about the representation, particularly of children of color in, in children's literature in the U.S. But, so she crafted this magnificent metaphor that books are a, wind, a mirror into the reader's and the character's own condition, uh, that books can be a window into the condition and lives of people who are experiencing different things or are coming from different places. And the best part is when a book becomes a sliding glass door that allows you to step into the next place and open your heart and, and, and create connections with other people. And the best books do that for everybody. Yeah. Uh, and how important it is to have a, a broad variety of of novels and, mm-hmm. and books, um, and not you know okay. So the only uh, teen or YA books that we will publish is like one, and yeah. thinking that the teens yeah. are uh, one and the same, and they yeah. are not. So yeah. yes, not everybody will see themselves in mm-hmm. in Melinda and in Speak, mm-hmm. but. For those where it will be a mirror, yes, it will be vital. Absolutely. And how books really can change lives. Hmm. Um, so, were you ever conscious of uh, Dr. Angelou when writing? Speak? Oh yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. I mean, that was that was done deliberately um, because that was the early days of censorship in U.S. schools. Uh, Dr. Angelou is such an important American, um, and she's black. Uh, so uh, she wrote about hard things, but I think that the, most of the criticism and most of the censorship her books experienced was because she's a black woman. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, they when I was a teenager, they they censored our books, they cut out chapters and things like that. And because her books were were being banned and discussed as being you know inappropriate, gosh, that's such a terrible word. When you call books inappropriate, when you call the topics of books inappropriate, you are telling the children who identify with those books or those experiences that they're inappropriate too. Mm. Um, So I snuck, she's in Speak for one reason and one reason only. I wanted my readers to know who she was. Mm. I wanted them to ask their parents or their librarians or their teachers. I wanted them to find her book. Yeah, because in the first one, she's mentioned that the the main character finds a poster Mm -hmm. and puts that in uh, up on the wall. And then in in Speak, the graphic novel, you can also see uh, her reading a novel. And for me, that was so striking how you both wrote about something that was an experience you had yourself Mm -hmm. and how by telling it, you freed yourself, but also how you then gave others the tool to speak, yeah. uh, and how you both been, you know, banned mm-hmm. and been told that what you write about is something you're being banned for writing about pornography, but that uh-huh. is not what mm-hmm. you're doing. You're writing about sexual assault, and you are, as the jury uh, pointed out, a writer who never, you know, shies away from the hard topics. Yeah. So we have a book about rape in, in Speak, we have Eating Disorder in Winter Girls, who, which will also be published in Swedish uh, next year uh, in translation. Um, and we have PTSD, um, as I said, in The Impossible Knife of Memory. Which is an impossible title. Yeah, I'm sorry is. about that. That was a bad mistake um, on my part. Which is Skjervora Minnan, and um, both Speak and... Um, 
Självra minnen are being sold outside and Lori will also sign after this conversation. Mm. Um, and we have the, the fact of mental health yeah. in, in various forms. Oh, yeah. um, and when reading Shout, you tell the story about when you met, met Walter Dean Myers, which is a, fe a fellow writer, yeah. uh, and it was the National Book Award cer prize mm -hmm. ceremony. Um, can you tell us about the encounter with Walter and yeah. what he said about the books that you write? Yes. So Walter Dean Myers is like, like, a, like a, a half a generation was. He's sadly passed away a few years ago, but by half generation older than me. So sort of big brother kind of age, right? And um, you have to imagine me, a country mouse in big New York City, and I, you know, with this dress and just terrified. <laughs> One of the nice things the National Book Award does for those of us who are nominated for children's literature is they have us visit schools, we have a, a press conference with teen journalists, um, and we have lots of opportunities to interact with teens and children. And so that was sort of, you know, my book had just been out for a few weeks. They, the jury in, in that prize gets the books early. So I was just like, what's going, what is my life? And then Walter Dean Myers is one of the most gracious, loving human beings in the whole world. And I didn't even know how to be an author or how, what is this? They don't tell you that, the publishers don't. And so I just watched Walter, he was so kind and very welcoming. And there was one time when we were all going out to lunch after we had met with students and Walter was sitting at a, at a table talking to a teenage boy and he said, Go on without me. This is more important. And so, I, and over the years, we'll just learn so much from Walter. So we're at this giant dinner, you know, and everyone's wearing big dresses and fancy tuxedos and things like that. Just like the opposite of what authors are, for the <laughs> record. They should make award dinners for authors, like at a pancake house. <laughs> and we can all come in our bad stained sweatshirts. Um, and then the, uh, the, uh, juror, the, the chairman of the panel for the Children's Award came out and she started talking about the need that, for literature to protect children. And because in that prize, it was, um, you know, for books written from babies all the way up to teens. And Walter's book and my book, his book was called Monster. It's a fantastic book. Oh, I hope it's in Swedish. Is it in Swedish? I have no idea. We should talk publishers <laughs> in the room. Um, and, and Monster, uh, Walter's a black man. And it was a story about a black teen boy who uh, was accused of a crime and, you know, being seen as a monster. Mm -hmm. It was, had everything to do with racism and the vilification of teen boys, um, teen black boys in America. Stunning, stunning book. Um, and this woman comes out, lovely lady, I guess, and said, <laughs> we have to protect our children. And Walter looked at me and, and he just kind of lifted the glass and he said, well, we're not going to get it. <laughs> and that's when he poured the first glass of wine yeah. for the night. And it was, it was, you know, remember, I'm still this kid, this country mouse, and I'm still learning the role of an author. And I'm learning for the first time how shockingly uh, people perceive children differently. Mm -hmm. People perceive teenagers differently and thus have pretty strong opinions about which book do you hand to a child. I get so frustrated. Let me back up. I understand the desire, uh, the reflex, to want to protect children, right? Um, and in this fantasy world that, that so many adults have in their heads, we get to protect all of the children. And that I love that desire, but... We like we don't say to ourselves when we're thinking about small children, you know what, I want to protect them from being hit by a car, so I will never let them cross the road. That's how I will protect them. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't work that way. You know, because you, you're, you're not foolish, and so we spend a lot of time teaching children safety, because we know that true protection comes from being honest with kids and giving them the tools to navigate a confusing scary world. Um, and so uh, with, with, with role models like Walter, um, I was able to begin to navigate this, 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 this interesting point between the creativity and hopes and dreams of the author and the reality of where my readers were, our readers are, and try to craft books 
that wouldn't, wouldn't, when you're writing for teenagers, I don't think you want to, you don't want to, God, the last thing they need is somebody yelling at them again. You don't want to say, this is how you have to live your life, young person. Just listen to me, the wise adult. But I, I explained this to uh, the other day, I think I talked about when, you're writing, uh, when I'm writing for teens, I start the picture, I start the portrait with my words, but I trust the reader to fill in the gaps. I'm always writing from a first person, intensely first person point of view, which means the reader has to kind of adjust to the way that character sees the world. There were some teachers and librarians who didn't like speak because they said, oh, she has a very bad attitude about her teachers. Um, and that's like disrespectful. Um, and I thought, oh, I'm so sorry for your students. But, um, but, but we have to inhabit, when we can find a way to inhabit the experience of any character, that's how we grow. Yep. That's how we learn. But also, <clears throat> whilst reading, um, it's the opportunity to really, the closer things, I, I would think, to walk in someone else's shoe. Mm. But it's also a safe place, yes. you know, that um, the reader can know that it is within these mm -hmm. pages mm -hmm. um, as learning how to cross a yes. street yes. Um, by reading they will then assume, or yeah. I do at yeah. least, that the author will sort of hold my hand even mm -hmm. though bad things will happen. Mm -hmm. And I will then get to experience whilst not experiencing it. Yes. Uh, it's not happening to me, it's happening right. to a character, but as close as I can get to have an experience I would never have otherwise. Yeah. Therefore, it is a great opportunity both to as a window yes. and as a mirror. Yes. Um, so Walter then said that it's not going to be us right. because we write about the kids that no one wants to see. Yes. Um, yes. And how your work then has, because Speak, it's such a powerful novel and deals with a hard yet important subject. And you have then continued to do so. Mm. How do you keep up, you know, not being discouraged or feeling... Um, when people have so much opinions mm. about your work, mm. um, I imagine without reading it, because then they would see it's not just mm. gloom. Um, <laughs> but how do you then continue to do so, to have that vitality and, and passion mm. to continue to write about different, difficult subjects. It did not come from me. Um, it came from my readers. Because when Speak was published, they began to, and at the same time, they also did this to, for Monster, for Walter's books. There was this new generation of literature, English language teachers in the US who were tired of handing boring books to teenagers. So they started to use the currently, the brand new books that came out. And thus, I was invited to speak all over the country at high schools, which was amazing. And I learned, but that was the, the thing is, I, I stopped speaking all the time. And I tried to find opportunities where I could listen to my readers and listen to my teens um, that, that, that were, and they always wanted, you know, a quiet moment. We did, had this yesterday at the embassy. We wound up talking to just this great group of kids. And they're so hungry for us to listen to them teenagers and we're so hungry to tell them how to live their lives because we're terrified right because we know how hard things are and it's, it's so scary when your kids are taller than you all of a sudden and if you've I had a son who suddenly started to smell really bad <laughs> and then he went and got all this body spray and then he smelled even worse you know and how do we talk about this um but I think that learning to listen to the readers. And, and the, the book I wrote, Twisted, that's from a young boy's point of view, I wrote that completely because of the teenage boys I met all across America who read Speak, and they liked it. They said it wasn't as boring as the other books. Uh, but when I got to talk to them, and I wanted to hear from them, well, what's going on? What's all going on in your life? And across America, across demographics, Every teenage boy had one of three and sometimes three problems. One, they were very confused about girls, regardless of their orientation or gender identity, just girls were baffling. Two, bullying was 
always on their minds, always. And it was the potential of bullying. And some had admitted to me that they bullied because it was better to be the one hitting than getting hit. And just that, that whole hierarchy, which explains so much of American politics. Um, and so many of them were just broken because they didn't either have a, a father figure in their life or the man who was either their biological father or filling that role as a father in their life, just there was no connection. And one boy just looked at me once and said, and this, I put this in the book, not the boy, but I put this line in the book from him. Everybody told me how to be a man, but nobody will tell me how. Mm. And so over and over again, I learned, the teenagers taught me, and if I know anything, it's all from them, they taught me um, how disrespected they were. In the US, we do a fairly good job of taking care of some kinds of kids, but when kids get to be teenagers, you know, they just become, they become food for advertisers and they get manipulated over and over again so the advertisers can reach into their pockets and take out their money with no thought of the integrity of their spirits, no thought of who is this person, how do we support them in their trip to adulthood. Um, and so... I'm angry all the time, Johanna. <laughs> I am such an, and I've gotten older and I've gotten angrier and it feels so good to be able to talk about it. If you're not angry when you learn about the state of, of, of the mental health issues facing our teenagers today, then we need to have a private conversation because either you don't know or maybe, maybe you're still hurting from when, it hurt, when somebody hurt you. So that anger... And those lovely voices that shared their stories with me, that's what keeps me going. Yeah, uh, because we will then talk about the situation with being, having your work being banned mm -hmm. and the effects of that, both for you personally, yeah. but also for the readers. Um, so it's not to say that the horrible things that happens in your novels doesn't happen to kids. Mm -hmm. Because they do. Yep. So if you have a problem with that, it's not your work. It's right. the reality that the teenager face. Exactly. And, and we'll not speaking about it mm -hmm. with young people and have them both verbalize but also um, finding solace in, yes. in, in that recognition. Mm. Um, it's to sort of take that experience explaining on mm -hmm. what it means to be a person and yes. how to deal with and navigate through the hard stuff. Right. So there are adults then who found speak and unfortunate other novels of yours mm -hmm. to be too bad or yeah. too... Yeah. Dangerous. Dangerous, thank you. Um, for, for young people to read... Yeah. So what does that mean then to have your book banned? Because in Sweden, uh, mm. we have a sort of the closest relation I can find or example is Christina Valdén, who I think it's 25 years ago or 20 years ago, she wrote uh, Kortschul, Short Skirt. Um, and that was, it's a couple of years ago now that some parents found out that that book was um, available at the library mm. for the kids and wrote to the school and wanted it removed. Mm -hmm. um, but what then happened was that was then um, like the ignition for a big debate yeah. on the matter of banning books. Right. Uh, and the publisher then released it as a free PDF file oh, um, online so the yeah. kids could read the book anyway. Yeah. But how does, when a book becomes banned in America, what then happens? Well, we've had two, so we've had a real change in the last three years. Speak has been challenged. A challenge is when a parent or a community member goes to the school and says, yeah, this is in a, inappropriate again, or I don't, you know, it shouldn't be read by children. And then schools usually have a, a process. You have to fill out paperwork. You have to read the whole book, which really upsets them. <laughs> and then you have to meet with a, commi a committee, and usually the committee is uh, people from the community, but also educators. And overwhelmingly, in the first, you know, 20 odd years of, of Speak's life, when the parent who was upset read the entire book, they said, oh, I, I withdraw my challenge. Mm. Because when you put page 134 in the context of the entire story, 
you see that it's not, it's not gratuitous. It's mm -hmm. not trying to be provocative. It's an experience that sadly is way too normal and, and ordinary in mm -hmm. a really horrifying way. And we see the character navigate that experience and then, you know, come to a better place after, after she's done this work. Things changed three years ago when parents in the United States, there were some parents who were quite upset about uh, some of the choices made during the pandemic. They were mad about schools closing, they didn't want to vaccinate their kids, and they didn't want their kids to wear masks. And, these, and it's interesting because people on both the right and the left finally found something to talk about. <laughs> and it was these parents who agreed on those three things. And um, there were some extremist politicians in the United States uh, who saw that group of parents as, as, as a tool. And they kind of weaponized the anger that those parents had. And they, they kind of, oh, come, you know, when a, when a, when a politician who's maybe not a, has good integrity sees that, they're just looking at, oh, votes and dollars, votes and dollars. And so, but then the pandemic has now, thank goodness, you know, mostly died down. And what are they going to do now? So they started to get them angry about books. So what we've had in the last three years is a very choreographed movement that is paid for in the United States by extremist politicians and the dark money groups that are supporting them. That one of these groups is called Moms for Liberty. It's a, it's a nonprofit. They have so much money. Um, but there are other groups too. And, and what they do is they're passing around lists of books, picture books for children. There's a lovely picture book about two male, it's a non-fiction book actually, two male penguins who fell in love with each other and became pals at a, at a library in, in New York City and about how they were given an egg and they got to have a child. It's just so nice. That needs to be banned because it supports homosexuality. Any books, uh, so they have these lists of hundreds of titles that are being passed around. And even, you know what, I kind of, I love Sweden a lot, but I know as I'm saying these words, it sounds like it's absurd what I'm saying. It sounds like, like somebody that would be like a Salvador Dali painting or something, right? So they have lists of books that are being passed around and because they don't want any children to read any books about the following subjects. Anything to do with people who are gay or trans or maybe aren't sure how they identify or, or who they want to love. Anything about people or written by people of color. Anything or written by people who are not Christian and especially their own, you know, the, the band of Christ, the, the kind of Christianity that these people identify with. And nothing about sex. Not even books that talk about, you know, the way that you get your period if you go through puberty in a female body. And, um, and, and they would call books like mine pornography. Um, and I, I, I've said this many times. If, if anybody finds the story of the, um, the traumatic experience and the long-lasting depression of a 13-year-old girl rape victim... If you think that's pornographic, then you need some help because there's nothing sexually arousing mm -hmm. about that. But they said, oh, there's porn in the schools, there's porn in the libraries, and they've really... Um, I, I try to be clear about the difference between the politicians who are doing this horrible thing and the parents who I think a lot of them are just parents who are worried about their kids mm -hmm. and their, their, their fears are being turned into weapons, tools of politics. And all over America, we have had um, thousands and thousands of book bans. I've got books banned in 17 states. Um, and you, it's hard sometimes to, to learn to get the meeting notes. You have to start listening to all these YouTube uh, recordings of school board meetings. Um, Pen America, you have Pen Sweden here. Pen America, I can give a link and mm -hmm. put it on my social media, can give you a very detailed report of all this. Texas, Florida, Pennsylvania, uh, not only are they banning books, but we have extremist groups that are trying to take over school boards. Mm -hmm. We have the we are in 1930s Germany in 2023 America. But then the effect you write in sh uh, shout that censorship is the child of fear, the father of ignorance and the desperate weapon of fascists everywhere. Um, and the consequences then. Yeah. So a book is banned that means that the library are not a you know they cannot buy that book. Right. Um, 
it's not being allowed to be within the schools, you know. Yeah. It can't uh, be in, in the, the classroom, education. it yeah. can't be in the library. So that means that kids will not then access your yeah. your work. Yeah. And they are then snatching away not only the mirror yes. for some kids, yes. but also the opportunity for window yes. and the training of empathy yes. and for for those who not have had that experience. That means that the world for the teenagers becomes really narrow, right? They are taking all of our kids um, who have been harmed mm -hmm. or who might someday be harmed and they are putting tape over their mouth and they're tying their wrists. You think we have a mental health problems with teenagers right now, just a few more years of this and we're really going to see the consequences um, and they're, they are horrifying. The other thing, I haven't so talked about this yet in Sweden, is that the teens, are, the kids are getting these messages from these hate-based groups that it's okay to attack and bully and hate people of color, people who aren't straight, um, uh, people have opinions about sexual violence and the bullying the amount of bullying in our classrooms is, and schools and communities is going through the roof. The number of attacks on Asian Americans just on the streets, skyrocketing. Because uh, there's one side of the political spectrum on the extreme right that has made their trademark to be hatred. That's, they, they're, and they're like, come, come, it's like Lord Voldemort, for heaven's sakes, and Harry Potter. Come join our side. You get to be angry and you get to beat people up. That's pretty upsetting. Yeah, I, I want you to, le uh, to read no, yeah. Librarians. Librarians, um, yeah. And your, your experience with the library. Yeah. And then to, for you in the audience to think that if lo that lorry... Yeah was brought into a library where the censorship happens, yeah. how this story would pan out differently. Yes, yes. And, and I like to play with language, which is not fun when you're talking to people, maybe my English isn't your first language. So I want to explain the title, it's Love Brarians. And I know there are some of you in the audience, so thanks guys. So this is about who I was when I was a child. I hated reading, loathed the ants swarming across the page, lost my excitement about school, fought, reduced to a puzzle of missing pieces. Once branded, the feeling of stupid never fades, no matter how many medals you win. But then, we rode the bus downtown, me and Leslie, who majored in music and lived in our attic, Mary Poppins, with a New Jersey accent, we rode the bus downtown, the coins hot from my hand, plink, plink, in the box next to the bus driver, all the way downtown to a Carnegie library built by an immigrant so everyone could read, free and untrammeled by politicians seeking to bind them into ignorance, chain them to the wheel. Leslie promised that she'd read me the books so I didn't have to be afraid of mistakes and I wrote my name in big letters, got my first badge, a library card. I asked the librarian, can I take out all the books? And she answered quite seriously, of course, dear, just not at the same time. <laughs> and so, with extra Leslie help, and a chorus of angels disguised as teachers and librarians for years, unstinting with love, and hours and hours of practice. Those ants finally marched in straight lines for me, shaped words, danced sentences, constructed worlds for a girl finally learning how to read. I unlocked the treasure chest and swallowed the key. Mm. Thank you. <clears throat> so then in March, uh, I believe it was. March 7th, yeah. uh, pretty early in the morning, yeah. Um, so 
You've been doing this work for so long and I imagine from time to time feeling despair mm -hmm. or finding the source to carry on mm. and then Boel Vestin calls. Yeah. And yes. what happens then? Well, uh, Boel is my new best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've offered to clean her house, you know, whatever. Yeah, and, and, and two, remember too, we've come out of the pandemic and by, by March, and, but now these attacks are coming up. And uh, every author I know is being attacked. All of our school visits are being canceled. And I'm particularly fearful that for the new authors who are just starting their career and having the door slammed shut. And also you're talking about how vital meeting your reader has been. Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I really was questioning, I was quite depressed, had been for months and months, and was really, really having those really not fun conversations with myself about well, what have I done with my life? Is this really going to be destroyed? I was, I, was, I was very depressed and I was trying to write on the next book and it was not going well and I just was thinking, okay, it's over. I'm going to have to come up with something else. And then the phone rang. I was working on chapter 14 of the new book, badly. And the It's not the title of no, the no, book. No, no, <laughs> no. The work was no, no, yeah. different book. But, um, and the phone said that the phone call was coming Sweden, from Sweden and I thought it probably was a new kind of scam. Um, but I answered it thinking, because I have a friend who I thought was in Sweden. And, and, and Bol said, you know, coming, calling. I don't, honestly, I can't remember exactly the words because I was so stunned when, when she said, Astrid Lindgren, Lindgren and I, I, my heart stopped and my knees gave out. And, and I had to, I think I asked you, Bol, to repeat several times what you said. And it's still, honestly, Johanna is not fully sunk in. I mean, even though I look great in that dress. It is not fully, I don't know if it ever will, but it was just like, my heart opened again. And then later when I read the, uh, the, cita the, full ci the short citation and also the full citation of the jury where they mentioned that I wrote about class. When it was so clear that that incredible jury has really seen what I was trying to do at the time when my own country people are, are wanting to burn and throw out my books and the books of all of my friends. Um, and it, then it's in the name of Astrid Lindgren who um, has been my hero for so long for many different reasons, depending on my age. But I know how much and how much she changed the world with her passion for children, the rights of children, and, and, and the, her social justice kind of... I'm going to be fine. I feel very strongly that, that well, obviously, you know, the, I think the jury is brilliant. Um, but um, I feel that this award, among many other things, this award is the universe giving me permission, actually possibly kicking me in the rear end, to keep going. And, 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 and to keep writing and to keep listening to our kids and, and to keep, you know, trying to support our community of authors um, But if we let them take our voices away, if we let them take away our artistic freedoms, then we might as well dig our own graves and crawl into it. And this has strengthened me, and I'm ready to stand up and speak up again. Awesome. Before, yeah. <clears throat> I have devoured your body of work And I had so many questions, and I see that the time is oh, almost oh, up. Man. Fortunate for us, you're mm. coming back to yeah. to the book fair in Gothenburg in in the autumn. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I will then ask you the questions I didn't yeah. manage to squeeze in. Okay. So uh, before I end, which I want to do by reading Laurie a poem, mm -hmm. 
after reading your entire body of work and now have been listening to you both in, in Lund at Litera Lund and uh, on the prize ceremony, this poem came to mind. Um, but I want to say thank you for coming and thank you for coming. Uh, and Laurie will be outside signing her books. Uh, so please buy one for you and one for a friend. Um, and I will then close this by reading one of my favorite poems, mm. and I have shortened it some. Um, you may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, oh. I rise. Just like moons and like the suns, with the certain of tides, just like hope springs high, still, I rise. Mm. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders failing down like tree drops, weakened by my soul's cry, soulful cries? You may shoot me with your words, you may cut me with your eyes, you may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I rise. Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from the past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak that's wonderful, wondrously clear, I rise, bringing the gift the ancestor gave. I am a dream and the hope of a slave, I rise, I rise, I rise. Oh, thank you so much. Tell and that is, that. Uh, I will, I rise by Dr. Maya Angelou. Dr. Maya Angelou. Yeah. So oh, thank you, Lori. Thank you, darling. I and thank you for coming. I appreciate that. Susan Tack, I... Oh, what a wonderful way to end. Yeah. Oh.